All right, will you bow with me in prayer? God, we are convinced of that. We believe it by faith that your promises never fail and that your plan for us is a good plan. (laughs) And Lord, sometimes we are going through things and this is probably one of those seasons and maybe for other reasons than just the obvious ones and it may not feel like this is a good plan It may not feel like you are paying attention. It may not feel like you are at work in our lives, Lord, but we know that you are. We know that you are a God that has a plan for us. We know that you are a God who wants the best for us and that works for good even in the midst of every kind of situation that we are facing. And so, Lord, we pray for um, those in our congregation. We pray for those that are in this space today, those that are watching online, those that are across the globe that are tuning in, Lord, we pray that you would be real and that you, your presence would be, would be felt and that you would remind each of us that your plan for us is a good plan and that you are working all things for good for those who love the Lord. And we love you. In the name of Christ, we pray. And everyone said, amen. Give the Lord a praise offering today. All right, you can have a seat. Welcome, welcome to those that are in the blue seats here at Fairfax, those who are watching online, whether you're in uh, the local area watching online uh, or whether you're in another state. Uh, Some of you are other places in the United States, some of you are other places around the world. We're just so glad to have you with us uh, today. A couple of words to those that maybe are here for the first time. You found us online or you've made your way in, or someone invited you to come, or you saw that the church was open and said, well, let's, let's check that out. We're so glad that you are with us uh, today. We would love to get connected with you. And I know it's kind of a weird season where it's hard to connect during this time, but there's a couple of ways to do it. If you're watching online, there's just a little button at the top that says new here. If you click that, give us some information, we'll follow up and, and, and give you some info about the church. And if you're in the sanctuary and you're new, a couple things you can do. Stop by the table on your way out. Just let someone know, hey, I'm new here. It's my first time. I'd like to find out a little bit more about the church. Or if you want to text Fairfax Info to 94090, you can do that. And there's like a little decision tree that you can make. And one of the things you can do is if you're new, give us some information. So the other thing I want to let everyone know about, we talk every week about small groups. And we've had an amazing summer. I, I just have to tell you that we've had a lot of folks that have gotten into groups during this season. In fact, during this whole pandemic season when we haven't been able to meet in person. And uh, our groups are growing. Some fascinating things that are happening. Uh, They've gone global. We have folks that are in our small groups that are around from around the world. But we're now preparing to kind of get ready for the fall. And so we're putting our groups together for the fall. So this is a great time. If you're not already signed up for a group, this is a great time to get signed up. And uh, if you're online, there's a little button there that says groups. You can uh, click that. If you're here, again, stop by the table on your way out or just text Fairfax Info to 94090. You'll see some things there about small groups and then you can give us some information. We'll help to put you in the perfect, perfect group. And I just want to say that all of our groups in the fall through the end of the year, all of our groups are going to be online. So all of our transit groups, all of our neighborhood groups, All of our support groups, recovery groups, all of that are going to be online. What we are going to do is uh, we are going to have what we're calling um, huddles. It's it's groups of four or five individuals. We're going to start out just doing it with our transit ministry and just kind of uh, see how it goes, use them as the guinea pigs, all that. So it's our young adult single ministry, and they're going to be huddles of four or five. They're going to be in homes um, they're, they're going to be social distance, face masks, all of that to provide as much safety as possible. But an opportunity with a very kind of small covenantal group to be able to start to have some kind of in-person experiences. So we're excited about that. Uh, the other thing we're excited about, I mentioned last week, is that our kids ministry has been doing this webinar, this Zoom webinar during August. And it's on Wednesday nights at 7.30. <clears throat> it started last uh, Wednesday and um, they uh, are going to be, they're dealing with things basically to help parents to kind of navigate this new season as we go into the fall and kind of develop new family rhythms and all that. This Wednesday, I just want to let you know, the topic is coping strategies for caring for anxious kids. 
And uh, I know that just this whole season has created a lot of anxiety, not just for kids, but for parents and, and just for everyone. And so if you're interested in that, uh, all you have to do to sign up is go to fairfax.cc forward slash events, and you can get signed up for that. Something else about our kids' ministry. So I noticed more and more kids that are coming in uh, for the weekend. This is absolutely awesome. And I wanted to just give you a little heads up. Maybe for some of you, you're going like, when is children's ministry going to start on the weekend? And will it ever happen? And is there hope? And yes, there is hope. And uh, September the 13th, we're going to start um, a small uh, kids programming during the 930, this service, and the 1115 service. And it's going to be for uh, a smaller group of kids so that we can... Social distance, so we, everyone will be wearing face masks, all of that, to provide as safe as environment as possible. And, um, and it's going to be an, uh, a registered event, so you'll have to register, parents, you'll have to register your kids for that. So that starts September 13th. You won't be able to register until basically a week out from that event. But be looking for that date, and we're going to start with that and then kind of build from there. Again, just trying to do everything that we're doing, we're trying to do as safely uh, and responsibly as possible and just kind of take steps as they make sense. So that starts September 13th. <clears throat> One other thing before we hop into the message here is that um, last week I talked about we started this Lebanon Relief Fund. Um, you know, our hearts are broken by everything that is going on in Lebanon on top of everything that was already happening, a financial crisis, the pandemic, social unrest in so many different ways. And now this explosion that has... Um, leveled so much of the city and 300,000 folks, more than that really, that are homeless and uh, food supplies that are really like days away from coming to an end. And so we're responding to that and we're actually partnering with Heart for Lebanon, which has been a long-term partner for us, 13 years for us. And uh, they have already um, uh, completely kind of retooled and regeared and mobilized, remobilized their 80 folks to help respond to this need in Beirut. So there's a real system on the ground, and they're doing a church based response where they're working with local churches and local Christian evangelical schools that are in the city to help kind of position them to be outposts of hope within the city. It's really, really cool what they've done. And uh, so we're working with them. Hundreds and hundreds of folks are going to get. Um, restoration, repair, and, and much-needed supplies, life-giving supplies, all of that. So you've already responded. I think we had over $10,000 that were given just this week towards that. And, and then this week, yeah, that's really cool. That's awesome. We should celebrate that. And, uh, and then uh, uh, someone came along that's connected to Fairfax and very generously put up a $25,000 match and said, if we raise the $25,000, they'll match the $25,000. It'll be $50,000 from us. And the $10,000 we've already raised counts towards that. And so God is just doing something, and I know that you want to respond to the need that's there. So if you want to give to that or you just want to give to the ministry of Fairfax as an act of worship uh, today, if you're watching online, there's a little button at the top of your screen that just says give. You can, you can give that way. If you're here in the sanctuary, uh, there's boxes in the back of the sanctuary. You can drop your offering in there. If you put a check in there and you want it to go to the Lebanon Relief Fund, just note that in some way on the check. Or you can text uh, Fairfax Give to 77977 and you can give that way as well. All right, so we're in the second week of this series called Better. And one of the things that we're doing um, is just interviewing some folks in our church about how, kind of what is the better thing that God is doing in your life, like during this weird season that we're in. God always wants to do something better no matter what it is that we're going through and how is it that God is working and doing something better in your life during this season. So take a look at this. It, you know, All right. so. cool. Over the last five months, I've really been able to prioritize relationships in my life, relationships with family, friends, my wife, uh, just because we don't have the ability to congregate together anymore like we used to. Uh, that means I've been able to prioritize daily phone calls with family members and friends and Zoom calls with big groups of people and having really intentional conversations with people that I might have otherwise never had. And we don't have the distractions anymore of what restaurant are we gonna go to 
or let's go out and do this thing tonight. I've really been able to focus on my relationship with my wife and the people that I hold dearest to me. And that is how God has made my life better. Cool. Can we give it up for that? I like how Logan gets to the end of it and says, I like that one. Like, uh, that's what I wish I could always say when I get to the end of a sermon. Like, I like that one. Uh, sometimes that's true. Sometimes that's not so true. So just what is, I just want you to think about what is the better thing that God has been doing in your life over the last three or four or five Months. God always is wanting to do a better thing. What's the better thing that God is doing in your life? And we're going to be telling some of those stories uh, over this series. So, so we're in this series called Better. It's a study in the book of Hebrews. And I mentioned last week in giving kind of some background for the book of Hebrews. And we don't know who the author is of the book of Hebrews. Sometimes books of the Bible, they declare who the author is in the text itself. Hebrews doesn't do that. And so we don't know, maybe Paul, maybe Barnabas, maybe Apollos, maybe another one of the disciples. But what we do know about the author of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, is that he was intimately acquainted with the disciples that surrounded Jesus during the ministry of Jesus. And so he is familiar with the apostolic teaching and he is very familiar with his audience. He knows who he's speaking to. He knows who he's writing to because he assumes some things about them. He assumes that they know about the Old Testament. He assumes that they know about the Mosaic Law, that they know about the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. He assumes they know about the Exodus story, about God leading the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage. He assumes they know about the covenant that was established with the people of God, about Mount Sinai, about the Ten Commandments, about the tabernacle that was built, about the journey 40 years through the wilderness, about the fact that the Israelites were taken to the promised land, that he assumes that they know all of that, which means that the audience for the writer of, for Hebrews were Hebrews. They were Jewish Christians, people who were Jewish in their background but had come to believe in Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the author's primary message to these Jewish Christians is that Jesus is the better and ultimate expression of everything they know about the Old Testament and the narrative of the people of Israel in the Old Testament. That Jesus is the ultimate and better promised land. That Jesus is the ultimate and better rest. That Jesus is the ultimate and better advocate. That Jesus is the ultimate and better. A priest, that he's the ultimate and better sacrifice, that he's the ultimate and better temple, the ultimate and better tabernacle, that he is the ultimate and better expression of everything that they have read about in the Old Testament. And last week we talked about how Jesus is the better and ultimate word of God, that Jesus is the exact representation of the character and the nature of God. He is the ultimate reflection of God's glory. He is God himself. And so if you want to know what the character and nature of God is, what the writer of Hebrews is saying, look at Jesus. Just look at Jesus, and then you will see what God is like. Then you will see the nature of God. You'll see the character of God. You'll see the love of God. You'll understand how God, who God is. Just look at at Jesus because he is the ultimate reflection of God's glory. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says, we have to be furiously obsessed with keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Because if Jesus is if Jesus is the one that holds the universe together with the just simply the power of his word, if just with the power of his word Jesus holds this universe together, then Jesus is not someone we can put on the shelf during the week and drag out on Sunday and do our religious thing on Sunday. That Jesus is the one that we have to keep our eyes fixed on every moment of every day. That's what we talked about last week. This week, we're gonna talk about how Jesus is the better rest. And I mentioned last week that this letter was written to people who were exhausted. They were exhausted by the challenges that they were facing. They were exhausted by the difficulties they were, fa they were facing. They were exhausted by the fact that they had associated with Jesus. And in associating with Jesus, they had experienced 
and were experiencing some persecution, they were exhausted. They were so exhausted that they were, in many cases, giving up hope. They were so exhausted that they were just saying, I can't do this Jesus thing anymore. I can't do this church thing anymore. I'm just, I just have to lay it down. And, they, and some of them are turning their back on Jesus. And so the writer of Hebrews addresses this exhaustion and talks in chapter 4 about rest. Now, what he says to these exhausted Christ followers in the first century is true for us as well. Because all of us need rest. Like even in normal times, even when there's not a pandemic, even when there's not social unrest, even when there's not all the other stuff that's going on, even in normal times, life can be absolutely exhausting, right? And there's a pretty good chance that many of you, maybe most of you, who are watching online or you're here in the sanctuary, are really, if you were to be really honest, are feeling a little exhausted right now. And maybe it's the pandemic and the fact that it just goes on and on and on forever. Maybe it's what's happening with the schools this, this fall. Maybe it's the social unrest. Maybe it is family issues that you are dealing with or financial issues that you are dealing with or work issues that you are dealing with or health issues that you are dealing with. But whatever it is, there is just a sense of exhaustion and you need rest. And in chapter 4, the writer of Hebrews reminds us of what that rest looks like and how we can actually experience the rest that we need. Now, here's what's interesting. I'm going to read the first 11 verses of Hebrews 4. Okay, it's a big chunk of scripture, but I want you to hear it. I want you to hear it all at first. We're going to break it apart later, but I want you to hear it all at first because in 11 verses... The writer of Hebrews uses the word rest 11 times. Just count them as we go through. Either rest or resting or rested. He uses that term 11 times in these verses in a lot of different ways. And we're going to talk about that as well. So maybe as I read it through the first time, it won't make a lot of sense. But hopefully as we unpack it, it'll start to make a little more sense. Here's how it starts. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands... Let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short. For we, have, we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Now, we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. So which is it, right? And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all of his work. And again in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David, or as was said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Okay, 11 times in 11 verses, God is talking about rest. The writer of Hebrews is talking about rest. And I know that's a lot, so let's just kind of break it down. First of all, the author uses the term rest in this passage in several different but interrelated ways. And if you're going to untangle all that he's saying and really understand it, you have to understand the different ways that he's using the same word, rest. 
Because in some cases, when he talks about rest, he means this by it. In other cases, when he talks about rest, he means this by it. And then in other cases, when he talks about rest, he means something else entirely. And the passage doesn't make sense unless you're able to kind of go through and say, okay, when he's talking about rest, he's talking about this here, he's talking about this here, he's talking about this here. The first time or the first way in which he uses the word rest is talking about the rest that is related to the promised land. You know, the promised land was that, that piece of real estate in Canaan that God led the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage into. And the first use of the term rest in this passage is talking about the promised land and the rest that comes in the promised land. This is what it says again in verse 3. Now we who have believed enter that rest just as God has said. And that's it. He's talking. We're, we'll come back to that one. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Now that's a quotation from Psalm 95. And it's recounting the time when the Israelites have been led out of Egyptian bondage, uh, out of Egyptian slavery. They're being led through the wilderness to the promised land. God has spared their lives. He has given them a pillar of fire, a cloud of, of uh, a fiery cloud to guide them to the promised land. He has provided manna from heaven. He has done all of this stuff. It is taking them now out of slavery into the promised land. And you would think they would be overwhelmed with gratitude for what God has done. But like us sometimes in the things, we should be overwhelmed with gratitude, but then we are not overwhelmed with gratitude, and they weren't. They become very ungrateful and, in fact, turn their back on God. And the result of them turning their back on God is that they lose their chance to enter the rest that the promised land provided. And all of them, in fact, they all die off. Moses dies off before he gets to the promised land. All of the adults who came out of Egypt, who were brought out of slavery, they all die off. In fact, it's only Caleb and Joshua who lead the people of Israel after 40 years into the promised land and the people who follow them are basically the next generation that was born while they were in the wilderness so everyone who comes out of Egypt they actually miss the rest of the promised land now the reason that the promised land represented rest for the Israelites is because when they were slaves in Egypt they were worked into the ground. They didn't get a day of rest as slaves. They didn't get a moment of rest. They worked from sunrise to sunset. They were always working every waking hour. It was grueling, nonstop, back-breaking work. It was dehumanizing, forced labor, much like the slaves in America experienced for 250 years, and much like slaves all over the world. You know, there are more Slaves. There are more people enslaved now in the world than in the history of the world. And one of the things that characterizes that slavery is this dehumanizing labor, this back-breaking, grueling, non-stop labor where folks are dehumanized and from the moment they wake up until the moment they go to sleep, they are forced to work that's what was going on but God delivered the Israelites from that slavery and this is what we're told in Deuteronomy 5 about that and this is where it gets really really interesting it says remember you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and outstretched arm and already set you free therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day now You read that passage and he goes, wait a second. What does God delivering the Israelites out of Egyptian bondage, out of their slavery, have to do with the Sabbath day? This idea of taking a day, one day out of the week, the seventh day, the Lord's day, that well, would be the the Saturday. And what what does that have to do with the fact that they were set free from Egyptian bondage? It has to do with the fact that as slaves... The Israelites were not only slaves to their master, they were also slaves to their work. They labored with little or no rest. So for the Israelites, Sabbath rest, resting from their labor, was a declaration of freedom. 
It was saying, I am not a slave to anyone or anything anymore. I am not a slave to the Egyptians. I am not a slave to my work. I am not a slave to anything anymore. I'm not a slave to anyone anymore. I have been set free. And what the writer of Hebrews is reminding us here is that Sabbath rest, and I don't think we tend to think about Sabbath rest in this way, that Sabbath rest is a revolutionary act. That when you experience Sabbath rest, you are saying, I am not willing to be enslaved to a system where my value and my sense of worth and my dignity and, and my sense of identity of even who I am is simply the product of what I produce. That I am not willing to be a slave to a system where, where who I am and my value is just about what I produce. That's what Sabbath rest, resting from our work, pausing from our work is about. It is a revolutionary act. When God brought the children of Egypt, Egypt out, uh, children of Israel out of slavery, out of the economic system in Egypt that was built on oppressive, abusive labor and into the promised land, God was not only giving them a home, God was giving them rest. The promised land was the place where the people of God could experience Sabbath rest. So that's one of the ways, when you read through Hebrews 4, one of the ways that the writer of Hebrews is talking about rest is as this physical, social rest that the Israelites experienced when they entered into the promised land. So that's one of the ways that he talks about that rest and how some of the people missed that rest because they were disobedient and turned their backs on God. The second way the writer of Hebrews uses the word rest is by referring to the fact that on the seventh day, God rested from his labor, right? He rested from his work of creation. Look at verses 3 and 4. And yet his work, talking about God, has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words, talking about the seventh day of creation. And on the seventh day, God rested. He rested from all of his work. Now, what does it mean that God rested, right? Because God, uh, God resting is not just about God getting exhausted and needing to take a little time off. It's not just about, it's not the same sense in which we need rest, right? It's not just about like, wow, I'm exhausted, I've been working hard, I need a breather, I need a break, I need a time out, I need a little bit of time away because I'm just exhausted because God doesn't get tired like we get tired. Like we get tired if we work too much. He doesn't get tired like we get tired. He doesn't get emotionally weary like we get emotionally weary. He doesn't get physically weary like we get physically weary. So what does it mean that God rested from his work. Well, if you go back and you read Genesis 1 and 2 and you look at the context, you begin to realize that God resting wasn't about God needing a break. It wasn't about God needing a breather. It wasn't about God needing to say, wow, you know, I'm just so exhausted. I've got to stop doing this for a little bit. It was about God being satisfied with his work, satisfied with what he had done. Because over and over again, after each act of creation, after each act of work that God did, God says, it is good. It is finished. It is completed. This is good stuff that I'm doing here. This is awesome stuff that I'm doing here. It is good. So God rested because he was satisfied with that which he had accomplished. Sabbath rest, and this is where I think we miss the point sometimes when we talk about Sabbath rest, that Sabbath rest is not just about taking a break from your work. It's about being satisfied with your work. It's about doing what you do with such excellence that you can get to the end of a task and say, that was good. Like Logan got to the end of the video and said, that was good. It's like getting to the end of a task getting to the end of a work day, getting to the end of a work week and saying, okay, that may not have been perfect. It's not that I'm going to ever reach perfection, but that was really, really good. 
that what I did, the way I used the gifts that God had given me, the way I steward the talents that I have, the way I put myself to that task, the way that I entered into that, that task, that was really good. I am satisfied with that. I'm satisfied that I was a good steward with the resources that God had given me. And why is that so important? Because when you're satisfied with what you are doing, when you can, can get to the end of something that you are doing and say, that was good. That was good. May not have been perfect, but that was good. When you can do that, then you can lay it down. One of the reasons we struggle sometimes to lay things down is because we're not satisfied with what we are doing. And part of being satisfied with what you're doing, saying, yes, I used my gifts and my talents well. I wasn't just kind of coasting on that. I wasn't just trying to get by on that. I wasn't just trying to like put in my hours on that. No, no, no. I did that well. And that when we are satisfied with what we have done, then we can lay it down. If you're not satisfied with your work, if you're just like going through the motions with your work, if you're, if you're not passionate about what you are doing, then it will not matter, folks, how many days off you take. It won't matter how many hours you work. It won't matter how many vacations you take. You will never experience rest. And that doesn't mean that your work has to be this big, attention-getting, world-changing, everybody notices it kind of thing. There can be deep satisfaction in all kinds of simple tasks. There can be deep satisfaction in planting a garden. There can be deep satisfaction in serving a customer with love and respect. There can be deep satisfaction in welcoming someone as they come into the parking lot or into this sanctuary. There can be deep satisfaction in, in picking up trash in your neighborhood. There can be deep satisfaction in washing a window so clean People wonder if the glass is even still there. Like there can be deep satisfaction in all of these things. That satisfaction in your work isn't about what you are doing. It's about the way you do it. It's about the attitude with which you do it. It's about the passionate intentionality in which you do what you do. That's what satisfaction in your work is all about. So that's the second way. That when the writer of Hebrews talks about rest, one is he talks about physical, social rest that they experienced when they entered into the promised land. The other way is he talks about this rest that is like the rest that God experienced on the seventh day, which was a satisfaction with what he had done, that what he had done was good. And then the third way, the final way that he talks about rest is the word, he uses the word rest in referring to the gospel to what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. That's the ultimate point that he's coming to. This is what he says. Look at verse 2 and 3 and then verses 8 and following again. It says, For we have also had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. He's talking about those who have heard the gospel, rejected the gospel, and those who have heard the gospel and said yes to the gospel. I mean, it's as simple as that for all of us. All of us have an opportunity, if you're here, if you're watching online, if you're here in the sanctuary, all of us get a chance to hear the gospel. The question is, do we say yes to the gospel? Do we receive the gospel? Do we respond to what Christ has done for us? Or do we say no? He says, those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Now, we who have believed, in other words, we've accepted this gospel of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we have entered that rest. He's talking now about a different rest. For if Joshua had given them this rest, this different rest, Joshua gave them a kind of rest. He gave them a, a physical rest, a social rest that they got when they entered into the promised land. But, he says, if Joshua had given them this rest, this deeper rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest. Oh, praise the Lord for this. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work. We're going to talk about what that is in a second. Just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter into that rest. So that no one will fall by following their example. 
of disobedience. Now, after Moses died, Joshua, right? Joshua was the one who led the people of Israel into the promised land. And in the promised land, they experienced physical rest. They were able to take a day where they did not work. They experienced physical rest. They experienced social rest, social justice. They experienced that. And that was awesome. That was incredible. Well, what the writer of Hebrews is reminding his original audience and what he's reminding us here is that you can experience physical rest. You can experience social rest. You can even experience emotional rest and still miss out on the deeper rest that our soul, for all of us, that our soul longs for. This deeper rest goes way beyond just being satisfied with what we have done. That's what the rest he's talking about. You know, God was satisfied with what he'd done. This is a deeper rest that's not just satisfied with what God, with what we have done. It's satisfied with what God has done. Satisfied with what God has done on the cross for us. It's laying down our efforts to try and earn God's salvation. Laying down our efforts, our work to try to earn God's favor. Laying down our efforts, our work to try to make God love us more. To somehow do something that will cause God to love us more. It's laying all of that down. And those efforts... It's those efforts that create this restlessness that is underneath the weariness and exhaustion that we sometimes feel. And if we don't deal with that, we will never experience deep rest. And that's why it says in verse 3, we who have believed have entered into that rest. Present tense. We who have believed, we have already now entered into that rest. He's saying that when we put our faith in Christ on the cross and what he did for us on the cross and the fact that he paid for our sins and he offers us forgiveness and he offers us a clean slate, a new beginning, a chance to start over, a chance to not have our past keep us from experiencing the future that God has for us, that when we say yes to that, when we accept what Christ has done for us on the cross, when we are satisfied with what God has done, we enter into that deeper rest. Can I get an amen? man for that we enter in to that rest but then I want you to notice you thought I was done I'm not done okay close but not done I want you to notice in verse 11 after he says we who have believed have entered into that rest present tense then in verse 11 he says let us make every effort to enter into that rest future tense Now, what's he talking about there? Well, one, he's definitely alluding to the fact that when Christ returns in the future, that we will experience this rest in all of its fullness when Christ returns. But he's talking about more than that. He's also talking about how this deep rest that we experience because of the gospel, this deep rest that we experience in Christ is not just a one-time experience. It's something that we have to keep pursuing in order to experience that same rest tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day that we have to we have to make every effort to keep entering in to that rest for me when i think about like a restful kind of um, image or vision of kind of what feels restful for me. I think about sitting, experiencing the rest of sitting beside a warm fireplace. Like we have, we have several fireplaces in our, our house, but we have this one that's in our family room that was uh, taken out of a house that was like 150 years old and, and was rebuilt. It was, before we even got into the house, it was put back. It was like this archaeological dig and they kind of put it all back together. And we have this beautiful stone fireplace, and, and it's huge, big, big hearth and all that. And I love, I love just sitting beside the warmth of that fireplace. In fact, I, I'm, I'm glad for the summer and the nice weather and all of that, but I'm looking forward to kind of some cool, crisp days where I can put a log on the fire and can sit there in the family room by the fireplace. And what's cool about sitting by the warmth of a fireplace, right, is that it can be, it can be chilly 
other places, but when you're by the fireplace, like, you know, it's cozy, it's warm. And, and you know, if you get up and maybe go even in our house, maybe go to another part of the house, it's kind of chilly there. You go outside and it's kind of chilly there. And the only way that you can warm up is to, is to come back to the fire. Got to keep coming back to the fire. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that Jesus is the fire. And sometimes we move away from the fireplace. Sometimes we move away from the fire. Sometimes we look to other things, other people, to give us the deep rest that only God can give us in Jesus. And when that happens, we often find ourselves depleted and exhausted and feeling a little hopeless. And maybe some of you have moved away from the fire for a little bit. You've moved away from the fireplace and you're feeling depleted and you're feeling a little exhausted and you're feeling a little hopeless. It's what happens when we move away from the fire. And the only thing that will bring us rest is when we come back to the fire. So the writer of Hebrews says, Come back to the fire. Make every effort. I love that phrase. Make every effort to enter into that rest. He's not saying, it's not an oxymoron. He's not saying, like, you got to work to rest. No, he's saying, you got to keep coming back to the fire. You got to keep coming back to the place of rest. You've got to keep coming back to the source of rest. You've got to keep coming back to the The only one who will give you deep rest. The only one in the midst of whatever it is that you are going through that will allow you to not be overwhelmed with exhaustion and be depleted and and be hopeless. The only one in the midst of whatever is going on that will give you rest. Keep coming back to that. Keep coming back to the rest. Keep coming back to the fire. Every morning, every morning, get up. Week after week, day after day, every morning just get up and say, God, today, 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 I want to rest in you. You know what I'm dealing with today. You know the conversation I have to have today. You know what I need to do today. You know what I've got to face today. You know what I'm going through today. But Lord, give me your rest today. Let me experience your deep rest in the midst of everything that I am going through. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Make every effort to enter into that rest and keep doing it day after day after day. God, we are so thankful for the rest that is ours in you. That you are the one who gives us rest. Physical rest, emotional rest, social rest. Lord, you are the one who provides rest. But that ultimately the Sabbath rest that our soul needs is this deeper rest that we only find in you. And so, Lord, for those who have never come to the fire, those who have never entered into your rest, those who have never believed the gospel, whether they're watching online, whether they're sitting here in the sanctuary and they've never said yes to you and the rest that you provide and being satisfied with what you've done for them on the cross and the forgiveness and the clean slate and the new beginning that it provides, I pray that today they can enter into your rest. And Lord, for those of us who have been by the fire, who have been by the fireplace, but maybe have moved away. And we're exhausted, we're depleted, we're hopeless, we're feeling overwhelmed. Lord, may we come back to the fire. May we make every effort to enter into this rest day after day after day, to be overwhelmed by your love for us, overwhelmed by your acceptance for us, overwhelmed for, by everything that you have done for us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Would you stand together?